In this video, I want to talk about row echelon form as well as back substitution and how we can use back substitution to solve for the unknown variables in a system of linear equations. And the best way to do this is really through an example. So here I have a system of linear equations already written out. And you'll notice that there are three equations and three unknowns, x, y, and z, right? It's also written in a very special form called row echelon form. And we'll get to what that is in a minute, but first I want to show you how we can use back substitution to solve for the unknown variables x, y, and z. Now the process of back substitution is pretty easy. We start at the bottom of this system of linear equations and we use our known variables to figure out what our other unknown variables are going to be in the other equations. So at the very bottom, we have z is equal to 1. This is our third equation. Since we already know what z is equal to, we can use the variable z, or the value for z, plug it into the equation above us, and solve for y. So let's do that. If we plugged in z into the second equation, we would get y plus 2z, which is 1, is equal to 3. And if we simplify this a bit, we'll get y plus 2 is equal to 3. And if we solve for y by subtracting 2 on both sides, we get y is equal to 1. So we just use the process of back substitution to solve for the unknown variable y. And now since we know y and z, we can use these values, plug them into the equation above them, and solve for our last unknown variable, in this case x. So if I rewrote the first equation with the values of y and z plugged in, we would get x minus 3 times y, which is 1, plus 3 times z, which is also 1. And that's equal to negative 1. So if we simplify this a bit, we'd get x minus 3 plus 3 is equal to negative 1. Well, negative 3 and 3 are just 0, right? So we're left with x is equal to negative 1. So we just use the process of back substitution to figure out the solution set to this system of linear equation. And the solution set is x is equal to negative 1, y is equal to positive 1, and z is equal to positive 1. This is the solution set to this system of linear equations. So back substitution is simply a process of working backwards to solve a system of linear equations just as we did. Now I mentioned that this system of linear equations is written in a very special form called row echelon form. And in order for a system of linear equations to be in row echelon form, it should follow four rules. And we're going to go through each one of these rules to understand how a system of linear equations can be in row echelon form. So if I scroll down a bit and I have these already written out, the first rule is that the equations with all zero coefficients are at the bottom of the equation set. So in each one of these three equations that we have, we have coefficients for each of the variables. In the first equation, we have 1 times x minus 3 times y plus 3 times z. So the coefficient for the x term is positive 1. The coefficient for this second term is negative 3. And the coefficient for this third term is positive 3. For the second equation, we have 1 times y plus 2 times z. So the coefficient for the first term is 1. And the coefficient for the second term is 2. And finally, for the third equation, we have 1 times z. So the coefficient of this term is 1. So now let's imagine that we had a fourth equation. But for each of the terms that have a variable x, y, or z, the coefficient for those terms would all be 0. So in other words, we'd have 0 times x plus 0 times y plus 0 times z. And that's equal to some real number. Since the coefficient for each one of these three terms, the x term, the y term, and the z term, are all zero, and this equation is at the bottom of these three equations, then this system of linear equations has satisfied the first rule, which is equations with all zero coefficients are at the bottom of the equation set. So the second rule, if I scroll down here, is that the leading coefficients of each equation is one, and this is known as the leading one. So if you look at the first equation, the first term is the x term, and its coefficient is 1. If we look at the second equation, 
The first term is the y term and its coefficient is one. And finally the third equation, the z term, the coefficient there is one. These three coefficients of all ones are called leading ones because they are at the very left hand side, the leftmost side of each one of these three equations. So since the first term in each one of these three equations on the left hand side, on the leftmost side, has a coefficient of one, then this system of linear equations has satisfied the second rule in order for this system to be in row echelon form. Now if I scroll down a bit to the third rule, every coefficient below the leading one is zero. So in order to understand this rule, I'm gonna fill in some of these blank spaces for equations two and three. So the second equation, which is this one right here, it's really just zero times x plus y plus two z is equal to three, right? This is the same exact equation. And for the third equation, well, this is really just like zero times x plus zero times y plus z is equal to one, right? This is the same equation as simply z is equal to one. And notice that the leading ones are on this diagonal here, this diagonal right here. Every coefficient below each one of these leading one terms is zero, right? So for the column of x's, which is right here, this term has a zero coefficient, and this term has a zero coefficient. So all terms below this one x have a coefficient of zero. Now let's move on to the second column here. We have minus three y. In the second equation, we have one times y. And all terms below it have a coefficient of zero, right? And finally, if we go to the third equation, that has a leading one term, which is one z. And every term below it also has a zero coefficient. So remember from the first rule, we have a fourth equation, zero plus x plus zero times y plus zero times z is equal to some real number. Since all of the terms below each one of the leading one terms of the equation above it have coefficients of zero, then this system of linear equations has satisfied the third rule. And finally, if we scroll down to the last rule, each equation has a leading one that is at least one space to the left of the leading one of the equation below it. So I know that this might be a little confusing, but I'll try to explain it in the most simple way I can. So if we look at equation two, which is this equation right here, and we look at equation three, which is this one right here, we notice that the y term in the second equation has a leading one, and the z term in the third equation has a leading one. Now, this term right here, this leading one term right here, is one space to the right of the leading one term of the equation above it. So that means that this leading one term y in the second equation is at least one space to the left of the term of the leading one term of the equation below it. So if you look at the first equation up here, equation one, the leading term here is the x term, right? It's one times x, that's the leading one. And it has one space to the left of the leading one term of equation two. So remember, this rule says that each equation has a leading one that is at least one space to the left of the leading one of the equation below it. So let me show you an example of an equation that has a leading one that is more than one space to the left of the leading one term of the equation below it. So what if we had an equation like this? X plus Y plus z is equal to one. And we had a second equation such as z is equal to negative three. Well, the leading one term for the first equation is this x term, right? It's the very left term that has a coefficient of one. So this right here is the leading one. And this leading one is at least one space, in this case two, to the left of the leading one term of the equation below it, in this case, the z term. So in this case, there are actually two spaces 